Sorry for those at home, I just unmuted myself. We read this before every board meeting, so I'm gonna read this now and then we're gonna start our meeting. Our Board of Education is here to serve the community and the values your partnership in education. We are very happy when community members attend our meetings and we welcome your comments during the public portion of our meeting. Please bear in mind that public comment is designed for members of the public to address the Board of Education rather than a time for dialogue. To facilitate public comment, the board asks that comments be limited to three minutes and basic norms of civility be observed. Please refrain from comments involving individual district personnel or students, as such matters should be addressed with the administration. Following public comment, members of the board or administration may ask for clarifying questions as necessary. Please know that the public comments are taken to heart and will be taken under advisement by the administration for any potential action or follow-up communication. For this reason, we ask you to sign in before making your comment. We have a bit of agenda and a few items to go over before. So I'll review some of the rules we're gonna have moving forward, um, just because I know we'll have some in-person comments as well as some um, Zoom, people Zooming into comments. So we'll just go over how that's gonna happen. And um, so we will be take, uh, have people coming in that way. So at this point, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian Kim Katusis for our uh, high school student reports. Good evening, everyone. Last week was Spirit Week in the high school. Because of the different cohorts, Ijo organized it so that each cohort could have one day in school dressing up and virtuals could dress up whenever they wanted. Monday and Tuesday were pajama day and Thursday and Friday were Spirit Day. Ijo officers were at the entrance point of the high school playing uplifting music and greeting the students as they walked in in the morning. We also had the Eagle mascot there, waving the Eagle Nation flag bright and early every day. Two weeks ago, EGO ran a successful blood drive at the American Legion, collecting 54 units of blood and potentially impacting 162 lives. They plan to host another blood drive in the spring. Additionally, EGO's fundraiser for breast cancer awareness called Real Kids Wear Pink was a huge success. The organization sold over 650 pink masks to the high school students, like I'm wearing right now, and collected over $2,500 for, don for donation. The school had a pink out day last Thursday and Friday when the cafeteria was decorated with pink decorations and all the students wore pink. Lastly for EGO, EGO is hosting a Halloween candy drive starting this Thursday and going until next Friday. They're encouraging students and faculty to bring in leftover Halloween candy so we can donate it to soldiers abroad. This week, National Honor Society applicants were notified whether or not they were accepted into the Honor Society. Induction plans are not set in stone yet, but they hope to happen in the spring. The varsity girls and boys soccer teams, the varsity girls tennis team, and the varsity cross country teams have all been competing well recently and will finish up their season in the coming weeks. Things are beginning to look up in the high school as there have been talks about cl starting clubs up at the beginning of November. Um, also at the next board meeting, there will be another student, a junior, um, with me to help represent the student body. Um, and of course, November 1st deadline is coming up for college applications and all the seniors are working very diligently to get those done and sent in. Thank you guys. Thank you, Brian. We really appreciate you coming and informing us every week. So I'm sure you have some work if you wanna scoot out, you're more than welcome or please feel free to stay. Sorry, my... Uh... Okay, next we're going to have any board committee reports. Okay, and then we're going to have the superintendent's report. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. A few Good things thing I want to mention. This is uh, October. It's National Principals Month, and I just want to take a minute to recognize our outstanding administrators here in East Chester uh, Dr. Jeff Capuano, Mr. Joe DeMeo. Dr. Vidya Bhatt, uh, Mr. Josh Elder, Ms. Madeline Lobu, Dr. Annette Keene, Dr. Daryl Stinchcomb, and Ms. Mary Doyle. Our administrators work exceptionally hard. They're exceptionally dedicated and talented, and we're very fortunate to have them. So I want to just take this month at uh, October National Principals Month to recognize them. Um, it is also School Board Recognition Week, or it was last week. And um, I want to read a proclamation that I received from the town of East Chester uh, from the supervisor, Tony Calavita, who presented uh, this proclamation this evening to our Board of Education. And I'll just read it briefly. It says, whereas School Board Recognition Week 
is an annual event observed by more than 700 school districts throughout New York State. We in the town of East Chester are fortunate to have among us those rare and special individuals who give tirelessly of their talents and who are committed to enhancing the quality of education our children receive. And whereas the members of the 2020-2021 East Chester School Board include President Sally Beltiti, Vice President Rob Summer, Secretary Judah Holstein and Trustees Vito Catania, Dave, David Caforo, Tara Conti, Aaron Murray, Stephen Projanski, and Cheryl Smith, and whereas the members of the East Chester School Board are dedicated to the students and community, they continually strive for improvement, excellence, and progress in education. Their unyielding commitment to a quality education can be seen in the countless young people whose lives have been shaped by the outstanding opportunities available through the work of the East Chester School Board. Now, therefore, I, Anthony S. Calavita, Supervisor of the Town of East Chester, on behalf of the Town Board of East Chester, do hereby present this proclamation to the 2021 East Chester School Board for their continued contributions to our community. So it's a beautiful proclamation, and we're very grateful once again for our applause to our Board of Education. Uh, just want to take a moment to thank uh, also our teachers and staff at this uh, approximately six week point heading into the school year. Uh, you know, th there's been nothing normal about 2020. There's certainly been nothing normal about the start of this school year. And I want to take a moment to recognize everyone because everyone, everyone's uh, jobs have been changed. Uh, they're nothing like what they were. And everyone is managing it is cheer cheerfully and um, with a total sense of duty and uh, working extremely hard. I also want to thank our community because I know their lives have been turned upside down and all of their you know, work lives have been commingled with trying to assist on remote days with our students. And that's incredibly challenging. And uh, they've been incredibly supportive partners. And we're fortunate to be able to work together in this wonderful community toward the, um, the finest education we can possibly deliver under these very difficult circumstances. And with that in mind, I wanna just let you know that, um, you know, we've engaged our community ever since the summer in trying to put together the best plan that we possibly can to make sure that our students are educated with our objectives safely and according to guidelines and uh, give them the best possible, possible education that we, that we can. And so, you know, we've been working in, in that regard now for six weeks. And certainly I've had feedback um, over the last six weeks about how it's going and there are a lot of opinions about how it's going. So we remain committed to listening and adjusting and trying to do the best that we can to see if there's any way we can continually improve on the situation as it exists because we know that we're not in an optimum situation. The way that we're uh, handling education right now in schools throughout the country is in some modified fashion using virtual means and live means and, and it's not um, ideal in any sense. However, um, our objectives have been safety and you know, high quality education. And we continue in that effort to partner with our community, continue to listen, to continue to find solutions to incrementally improve any way we can. And I wanna let you know that tomorrow, I will be releasing a, a link, a fairly substantial document, a lengthy document on our website and by email, to try to help walk you through, uh, everyone through, you know, what led us to the decision points that we, we have uh, come to currently, uh, what has been considered, what are some of the uh, issues associated with that, what are some of the costs and benefits, some of the roadblocks and challenges and opportunities. So we're gonna, I'm looking forward to having you uh, have those. And uh, hopefully that will give people some important background and things to think about and consider as we continue to move forward. I wanna thank our PTA council for forming a committee to uh, help us with the hybrid learning and fully support uh, hybrid and fully remote um, support committee. Uh, there, there's some survey, as you know, that's out through that committee. We thank the PTA council for their partnership. And uh, the last Monday, we had the opportunity to have a Zoom meeting with the PTA council to try to walk through some of the, some of the uh, issues associated with instruction as it currently exists. So I wanna thank uh, our PTA for being great partners. And um, I want to also, just remind everyone that um, we continue, you know, to look for every opportunity we can to continually evolve what we're doing. And uh, there's not a single one of us who uh, wants anything less than 
continued progress. Um, lastly, I'm excited because tonight we have a very special presentation from our uh, instructional department headed by Scott Wynn, our assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction who does an amazing job and he has an amazing team. And this team is with us here tonight to share with you a little bit more about what they do. Um, that team is Kristen Shearer, Susan Chester, Jared Blair, and Tom Lehman, uh, who are a dynamic team who keep our instructional programs moving forward. And I'm really excited for you to hear and observe and see. Hold on, hold on a second. Is there any way you can turn like a volume on tonight? Because I'm having trouble with this. Well, I, we can work with this. And um, maybe you can you want to stand maybe and then when they speak maybe they can stand it may, might be a little louder okay okay yeah. I don't think it's feeding back into our system it is. oh it is okay okay so what what can we do to help this people well, stand up it's fine if you have this your personal devices if they're just turned down low for your personal hearing but if it's louder then it's, it's echoing into the system Okay. Thank you, thank you. Sure. I, I'm I'm sorry. This is all very new to us. Is that better? Yeah. This is all very new to us. Typically, we don't meet here. And over the last three or four meetings, we've tried to adapt to the needs of the community to run a live meeting, but all that's distant, and also to Zoom them at the same time. And we've had a number of technical issues, so we're learning as we go. And we appreciate your patience with that. Yeah, is that better? So um, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm, I, if you couldn't hear anything I said, I, I will try to just give you an abbreviated version and we'll move forward. Uh, first of all, I just want to say um, thank you for coming. I want to thank everybody uh, who's here working so hard to try to continue to evolve our practice in what has been a very uh, challenging environment for the entire region, certainly the entire country, and trying to reimagine what education is like um, in the constraints that we find ourselves. We're committed to continuing to listen and learn and evolve and, and grow the best, the best that we possibly can. And I just had mentioned that tomorrow I'll be putting out a communication that may help people understand a little bit about how we, uh, how we arrive at decisions we arrived at, what are some of the factors, constraints, and opportunities that we face? And I think that you'll find that helpful. And uh, so that look for that tomorrow. I'll send an email out. It's also going to be on our web. And um, then I was just expressing how very proud I am um, of this team that you're going to hear from shortly, our instructional team, uh, headed by Ms. Mr. Scott Wynn. And uh, you know his team will be presenting to you tonight a lot about their work in the teaching and learning areas. So that's a, a shorter summary. I'm sorry you couldn't hear it earlier. That was not my intention to, and, and I had no idea. So thank you for letting us know. Mm -hmm. Okay, next we're gonna move on to the curriculum and instruction presentation. And um, Scott, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Um, folks, um, typically, I don't need a mic, so if you can't hear me, just let me know. All right, so let me just uh, pull up. I want to share my screen so that everybody can see. We have a brief for you. Okay, so uh, thank you to the Board of Education for, for having us here tonight. Uh, I am joined by, our, by the rest of the curriculum team um, who will uh, introduce themselves as we as we go through the presentation. Um, but tonight we're we're here to kind of give you a, a little bit of a state of curriculum and instruction in the district, and to give an opportunity uh, for you to hear kind of the vision of where we're headed uh, with curriculum and instruction within the district as we move forward. So let's start where we are. Obviously, the current state of teaching and learning in the district is extremely different than where we have been in the past. Uh, we are un operating under a, a hybrid and remote model, and there are challenges to these models no matter where we are. These hybrid models uh, were not something we ever anticipated, and it, this idea of remote instruction is something that we are contending with. 
It is not something that we ever wish we, we would have, but it is where we are. And in terms of the current state of teaching and learning, really we're operating under the premise of revisioning the whole concept of education. The work of teachers, the work of the district at this point has many different aspects that we're really looking at. The first being the prioritization of critical curricular topics. Under this framework, it is absolutely clear that we will never be able to cover the same amount of material that we would be able to do in a normal teaching and learning environment. With that being said, it has been the job of the teachers, it's been the job of the administrative team to look at the New York State curriculum and truly prioritize the critical topics that we wanna make sure that students are able to learn and are able to master. One of the second items that we really have been focusing on has been new assessment strategies. How do we determine what our students are learning and to what extent they're learning within this new environment? Obviously with students that are in every other day, with students that are in the twice a week, with students that are home all the time, this becomes a, a challenge and it becomes a, a situation that we really need to revision of how we're gathering that information. Third would be technology. Obviously much of this technology that we have embraced uh, is new and it is a learning experience for us. It's a learning experience for parents. It's a learning experience for students. And it's an opportunity for us to take on a challenge, but to also grow. Uh, as a district, we've been looking at technology uh, for the past couple of years. And one of the small positives uh, that has come from uh, this, this horrible situation has been a kind of a, a catapult for us forward with experiencing new technology. I can say it has been a definite bumpy road, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but as we're moving through, we are trying to make the best out of it and learn from these experiences. Finally would be the engagement of students and trying to make sure that students that are in front of us, the students that are in the hybrid model, the students that are in the fully remote model can be engaged as possible. This has been probably one of the largest challenges. And I would say, especially for our youngest learners. And that is something I know that we have a lot of parents here tonight who are here to support that, that idea and to discuss that. Really one of the biggest themes that we've been looking at is this idea of flexibility and responsiveness. The ability for us to take on a challenge, to be as flexible as we possibly can, and to respond to feedback from all different constituency groups to see what we can do in order to make this the best possible situation. That being said, professional development has been key. In order to take on these challenges, a lot of new learning has had to take place and we've been developing ways to reach our teachers and to provide the professional development and the learning that they need in different formats and on different topics as we've moved through. So the impacts of COVID-19, they are far and definitely deeply reaching. And I have this quote here from George Koros, uh, a, a famous educator, uh, educator and researcher, that change will come our way. We can go through it or we can grow through it. We grow when we seek, our, seek out solutions rather than letting obstacles hinder us. That is really the philosophy that this curriculum team has taken within this pandemic, that we are looking for ways in order to grow from this. What ways can we take the obstacles that are put in front of us and say, how can we use this obstacle to grow the district and to push our teachers and push our staff to really grow from this and be even better when we come out the other side of it. At the beginning of the year, uh, in my opening message to staff, I related the concept of, of our teachers and our administrators, our secretaries, our custodians, our monitors, our teaching assistants, everyone in the district as being superheroes. And I would say that our teachers, our administrators, everyone within this district has risen to that challenge and has shown us that they truly are the superheroes of this district. They are the ones who are really and truly working day in and day out to try to make this the best possible situation for the students that, they, that have been assigned to them. And I just wanna take this opportunity to thank all East Chester staff members for truly being the superheroes that we, th we, we originally thought they were and now know them to be. So looking forward, 
what are some of the things that we are focused on as a curriculum team with our teachers and with our administrative team? So from a strategic planning standpoint, we are looking to look beyond survival mode. We have started this year from the start of this pandemic, it was truly a situation of survival. How do we get from day to day? How do we make sure that our students have what they need right this second? Now we need to begin starting to look forward. What does this mean for us long-term? How are we going to move forward from this? And in discussions over the past several weeks, we really have begun to move past this idea of survival and look to define from a pedagogical stance what we truly believe here in East Chester about education. Not simply just what program do we like, what textbook do we need, but truly defining what it is we believe in from an educational standpoint. Some of the things that you see listed here are the ideas that have begun to arise as being some of the most important things to us. Things like a balanced approach, which you're gonna hear about from two of our supervisors in a little bit. This idea of a constructivist mindset, the idea that we're looking for our students to be able to take information and build from it. An inquiry model where we're building a situation where students are designed to ask questions. That is super important to us. Looking for an experience where we can have capstone experiences, where students, as they're going to be transitioning from different level to different level, where they can demonstrate to us that they have achieved the skills necessary to move forward. This idea of authentic assessment that students can take what they've learned and demonstrate to us, not just simply tell us through a, a multiple choice test, but truly designing assessments that tell us that students have learned. Differentiation is a key to all of this. And we're gonna talk more about that as we move forward, but trying to meet students where they are and help them grow from that point. How do we take what we're providing in the classroom and tailor it to much more individualized instruction for our students. And finally, equity and access have risen to a very high level for us. Being able to say that we truly believe that we are providing an equitable education to all of our students and that our students all have access to the kinds of learning experiences that they deserve. Part of this, and one of the critical elements in this that we've been discussing as a, as a team, is making sure that our curriculum is aligned vertically and horizontally. That as a student progresses through our system, that they are getting a solid experience that aligns from grade level to grade level. We have a very strong special education curriculum, uh, special education continuum in this district. And part of what we need to be able to do is we need to also be able to demonstrate that we are supporting our general education students in that same fashion. We're gonna be focusing on a multi-tiered system of supports. That is the next step up from what used to be known as RTI or response to intervention, but it's the next stage of that where we're taking and truly aligning a general ed continuum of services for our students that supports them from the minute they're in class to the minute that they leave. We wanna focus on tier one interventions, which are in-class interventions. How are our teachers supporting students right in class? We're looking at the idea of universal screeners. How do we collect data to ensure that we know where all of our students currently are and where we want them to be? And finally, this idea of technology. We embarked on a technology review last year. We brought in uh, an outside consulting firm to help us understand where we are in terms of technology from a hardware software standpoint, but more so from an instructional standpoint. How are we using technology to further instruction in this district? That report came back, we took that to heart, and we have now progressed to the next step which is setting a vision statement of what we want instructional technology to look like in this district moving forward. That, set, that vision statement is well underway and should be finished and hopefully adopted by this group, uh, probably by November, maybe December 
um, so that we have a clear vision and can begin the next stage in that process, which is action planning and goal setting to make happen what we want to see happen. So with that being said, we want to take a deeper dive now. Uh, I want to introduce the members of the curriculum team that are here and look at some of the, the work that's been going on and some of the visioning that's happening within each of these department areas so that you have a better sense of what this actually looks like. So I'm very pleased tonight to, to welcome Dr. Jared Blair, our supervisor of STEM, Ms. Susan Chester, our supervisor of humanities, Ms. Kristen Shearer, our supervisor of guidance, and Mr. Tom Lehman, our Director of Athletics, PE, and Health. So with that being said, I am going to turn it over to Jared and Susan, who are going to start from the humanities and STEM side of the curriculum. All right, so thank you everybody. Very happy to be here tonight to be able to share with you the work that we're doing and what we're thinking of for the future. So um, we wanted to begin with talking about where we are in 2020, 2021. So we spent, uh, you know, all of us spent a lot of time when school opened, simply providing teachers with what they needed, supporting them in their, you know, the new pedagogy and trying to cultivate a culture of risk-taking, encouraging teachers to start down a path where they may not know exactly where it was going to end, but they knew that they had a new tool that would be able to be useful for students. And one example that I can give you is a third grade teacher who came up to me and said, I tried using Google Forms today. I know there's a way that I can gather this information and assessment for my students. Again, third graders, eight years old. And I'm just not sure exactly how I get a grade from that or how I get the result. She didn't wait until she had every single detail. She knew that Google Form was something that she could utilize, used it with her students, then gathered that information from me. And with some help from Jared, we got her moving in the right direction. Another example from the STEM perspective is our teachers utilizing flipped lessons, lessons as kind of a new pedagogy and approach where maybe the whole group instruction that would traditionally be presented to students in a 10 minute segment at the beginning of the period would be screencastified or recorded so that it could be accessed from home utilized at home, viewed as many times as the student wanted, and then the time in the classroom could really be spent digesting that material, working with that material, which is where the true learning begins, right? And, and it actually takes place. So obviously time is of the essence, right? We talk about that on a day-by-day -day basis. So that brings us to our next bullet, which is content prioritization. Mr. Wynn talked about that a little earlier, but to just give you a little perspective as to where that's happening in, the, in STEM and humanities, um, one of my biggest areas of concern is mathematics, right? Mathematics involves progression. Students must build upon content and skills from year to year. So it is our absolute priority to prioritize the most essential content and the most essential skills in mathematics to make sure that a student who leaves grade one is ready for grade two mathematics and so forth all the way along the line. That happens by very, very detailed um, and uh, very big um, efforts to look into where we are in our curriculum. This started in the spring. We actually pulled together our teachers in cohorts K-1, uh, one, two in the major transition years, right? Two, five, five, six, and then all the way up through high school so that we could really say, okay, where did we really get after our shutdown, March to June, where do we need to pick up where we left off um, when we come back to school in September? And then we're still having those conversations on a weekly basis to ensure that we can continue the progression of the content. That's just an example in mathematics. It's also happening in science as well. Um, but obviously the content areas in science are a bit more uh, compartmentalized to the years. So we're really focusing on skill development when it comes to science. So, oh wait, nope, go back, sorry. sorry. Um, so just to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, echoing what Jared said, when Jared is meeting with um, elementary, um, you know, representatives from different grade levels in elementary mathematics, I'm having those same meetings with representatives from elementary um, uh, ELA. And again, looking at what curriculum documents we have in place, we're doing that primarily at the secondary level with building on work that we did last year with curriculum mapping, 
to be able to have a department of teachers lay out their maps for the year and then be able to say, okay, here is the areas where we have some repetition. There is a little bit of room where we could, you know, cut something away in order to, you know, save that precious time. But these are the things that are absolutely essential that we cannot, um, you know, send students to the next grade level having not mastered. So there's been a lot of articulation within grade levels and then between grade levels as well. Um, and then finally, in terms of reimagining assessments, one thing that I get asked by my non-educator friends and family is, hey, how are they doing tests in a hybrid model? How can you possibly give an exam when you have kids at home? So one big area that Jared and I have spent a lot of time working with teachers on is reimagining what assessment looks like. We've been encouraging teachers to use more frequent, shorter assessments. And we've also been encouraging them to think beyond the traditional paper and pencil text where everyone gets it at the same moment and it's highly secured. We can't secure everything when we have kids at home and kids that come in on different days. So we're asking teachers to look at um, types of assessments where collaboration between students and access to materials is part of how the whole assessment is built so that we're not constantly trying to police and secure or giving students um, uh, assignments and assessments where they're actually able to communicate with one, one another in a constructive way. So just to build on what Mr. Wynn said earlier, this is an opportunity for growth. Um, all of these areas, these three bullets and kind of our day-to-day -day work, these are all opportunities for all of us as professionals to grow in the practice that we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure student learning as an ultimate goal through the process. Yeah, so thinking a little bit about our future plans and where we wanna see all of this work go is um, we're looking at what we're calling a balanced model for elementary ELA and mathematics. And when I first began here, so this is you know, two years ago, one area in ELA that was of a big concern for teachers was elementary writing. And that was an area that I found was one that teachers were really ready to dig in and get to work. And we began um, developing writing units um, within grade levels K through three. And that work continued up until the closure in March. And again, we're hoping to pick that back up again at some point this year. But what came out of that work, in addition to these really well-crafted units that were made in-house by teachers, was a question of where does this fit in? I'm using the Wonders ELA program. They have their own pieces of writing. Now we've created something really fabulous. Where do I put that? And that got me to thinking about what is this overall framework that we're using to think, in my case, about um, literacy instruction. So similarly in mathematics, we utilize the Go Math program K-5, and I had presented to the board and to the community in February um, about my goals with mathematics in particular, talking about the utilization of a universal screener to really diagnose where are students at at different points throughout the year, and how can that data help inform the instruction of our elementary teachers um, in mathematics. So uh, with the Go Math program, we're really looking to kind of build upon that. But again, that is a program that we use, similar to Wonders for ELA, Go Math is a program. So the big question that we're asking right now is we've had access to many amazing programs in the history of East Chester, but it's not how do we as East Chester fit the program but it's how does the program fit us as East Chester? We don't want the program to really dictate or guide where we go with this. So through this kind of investigation and actually this revelation of, we need to have a philosophy. We need to have a true understanding of where we want to go in ELA and mathematics. So what, what's up on the screen right now is this concept of this balanced model of literacy instruction. And when I say balanced, I'm talking about two areas. So sort of on the vertical and the horizontal um, axis of this, of this chart. So we wanna balance our literacy instruction in terms of 
reading, writing, and then what we call phonics word study eventually evolves into more, um, uh, you know, studying of word roots and vocabulary as you get into the upper grades. And then we also want a balance of how that instruction is being delivered. Is it being delivered by the teacher to the whole group? We want that balanced with teachers that work are working with small groups and students that are working in small groups. We also wanna balance that with individual activities where students are showing what they know. And then again, in this model, we would then bring it back to whole group where there's a share and collaboration among students. So to maintain consistency in our approach, we're adopting a balanced mathematics model um, where we have this, the same idea that students are learning a concept in a whole group setting. I kind of referred to that when I talked about the flipped lesson um, where the content is being presented, but then we have these differentiation options and that's where the true mathematics understanding begins. So allowing small groups, maybe with a teacher focus, to really break down content for students that need that. It could be small groups that rotate for the entire class. It could be just a small group that really is demonstrating that they're struggling with the content. It could be the independent practice. So there is independence and autonomy when going through these complex problems. Math centers are a very common um, tool that we use, but it is an option where students can work uh, as groups, but maybe less teacher focused. So again, the, the, the focus with balanced mathematics is really targeting in the future and, and with our, our goals and our growth and development as a district in mathematics instruction is that kind of differentiation options area that, that really targets all of our students and really supports solid fundamental learning in mathematics. Yep, next slide. So I just want to, you know, have you guys imagine how this is developing. Um, I've, you know, I'm at, you know, at one, one end of our office and I've got my chart paper and I'm sketching out the chart that you saw just a few slides ago. And Jared is on the other end of the office on his piece of chart paper. And finally, when we were both done, it was like the big reveal and we hung them up on this big wall. And when we stepped back, here we are, you know, I'm, you know, in the humanities gal and he's our STEM guy. And we looked at what we put up on this chart paper and we couldn't believe the level of overlap and how similar the thinking was. Obviously, ELA and mathematics are very different in terms of content, but in terms of what makes for strong pedagogy and what helps students learn, those fundamentals are almost identical. And, you know, I began to think about how, you know, usually mathematics and, and, and ELA don't even talk to one another, but now you've got them sharing an office. And this is the, re the result is looking at how do we come up with one framework that can embrace not just a single content area. So I think if you look at this, it, you see the way the chart works, it kind of goes from the old school, I do under the model category the we do in the shared category, and then the you do. And when you really pair those types of learning experiences, the entire experience can be very profound for our learners. And then on the very bottom, we also began talking about how there were other elements that didn't fit in anywhere just under the guise of reading, writing, and mathematics. And we began to talk about what are the other big ideas that we'd like to see permeating through different classrooms and buildings and grade levels? And we came up with the one big concept of students adopting an inquiry stance where students are asking questions and then with the guidance of their teacher and through collaboration with their peers, they're actually able to answer those questions and produce products that have real value even beyond the walls of the classroom or the walls of the school. So there's our small group. It could be in a small group. It could be independent. It could be paired inquiry. And then below that, this is a method, you know, um, book clubs have been used in schools for a very, very long time, almost as long as they've been, you know, out in the, in the out of school community. Um, but beyond having students that are gathering together to read the same book, we can also have groups of students that are looking at different groups of texts called text sets. So they can be looking at 
different um, uh, pieces of scientific uh, writing, or they could be looking at different short stories or different poems or different images or historical documents. So using that model um, allows uh, students to be able to get into subjects very deeply to extend their knowledge. And it also allows for not just collaboration between students, but instant differentiation because you're able to give whole classes of students individualized um, readings and texts to work with. So the true excitement that came out of our conversation was talking about not just a focus on ELA and mathematics, but if we can truly adopt this stance and this model of instruction, this model can transcend mathematics and ELA and really be used by all of our educators to really enhance and kind of um, co coordinate the process of learning for our students. Yeah, so this was where after we had shared our chart paper, we thought, how do we now bring this into like a, a graphic that we can think about? And it's about, again, back to balance, balancing the level of teacher support and the level of student control. There are times in any classroom where it needs to be teacher directed. The teacher needs to show students exactly what to do or relay content or a skill. And there's also many times in the classroom where you want students to be independent, to have some level of control or choice over what it is that they're looking at or how they're representing their knowledge. And then there's all of that in between. And that's where this is sort of the, the, the visual that represents this pedagogical framework that we are hoping to move forward in the next rest of I mean, this year and in the future. Thank you, Jared and Susan. Appreciate, appreciate all that info. I'm going to turn it over to Tom Lehman, who's going to talk to us about phys ed and health. Great. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully you could hear my phys ed voice a little muffled, but it should be okay. Um, so just to start out, a couple of the things that I laid out in the slides to come was first an overall vision. Uh, this is my first year in East Chester. So obviously I have to come in and it's my job to really assess and evaluate what's going on as a department, work with our teachers and students to make sure that we are hitting on their strengths and interests. Um, then we'll look at the current happenings at the elementary and middle school and high school level, and then a look ahead. Um, so really circling back to the vision and how we are going to implement and get things done. So, so the first slide, uh, I think it's really important, like I said, to analyze and evaluate what is currently taking place, obviously under these circumstances with hybrid, remote, um, and in-person learning, our phys ed staff had to kind of readjust everything, what they even did in the springtime. From the spring, um, everybody's remote and they were sending um, you know, asynchronous lessons. And now we have to shift that. So we're teaching in person, we're sending stuff home and we still want to touch on the remote learners in a full. So I think the most important thing here is designing and developing a curriculum that meets the needs of our learners um, is done really collaborative, collaboratively with our teachers. Um, it really needs to touch on the student interest piece um, because if students are not interested, uh, our teachers will know about it and I, I will know about it. So I think it's constantly evolving. And I think Scott said it well to start. Uh, we went from, you know, surviving and just kind of getting things in place and making sure everything was going well uh, with the guidelines that are put into place in phys ed, 12 feet apart, wearing masks, uh, limited to no equipment to start the year. It was really a shift. And I think our teachers doing a great job and I really commend our students um, overall for really adapting and, and you know, having a good time in phys ed. And that's really one of the key components there. So really working with our staff to really develop a, a curriculum that works. Um, creating opportunities for our students that is not just uh, team sport related, right? In the past, in a traditional phys ed you know, program, it's uh, geared to team sports. But obviously right now we're focused on fitness and movement and uh, health education, which is actually really, uh, I think a very nice shift and will only enhance what we do in the future moving forward. Um, we're also in, infusing social emotional learning into our curriculum and Kristen will speak a little bit more specifically about that as we go. But physical education and health education go hand in hand with the social emotional learning part. So when you talk about teamwork, when you talk about uh, etiquette of the game and cooperation, that is all tied into social emotional learning. And we're trying to really uh, tighten that up and, and pair that with what the students are learning in the classroom as well as in the gymnasium so they could transfer that um, to wherever they are in whatever situation they're in. Um, also authentic uh, assessment opportunities 
to promote growth and development. Um, we, you know, we talked about vertical and horizontal, um, you know, curriculum mapping, and we talk about like progress. So how do we know a student is progressing from at the end of first grade to third grade to fifth grade to middle school and high school? And we'll touch on it a little later when I speak to it, but the standards based and there's outcomes that we should be looking at for essential skills. And that's how we will get there. Um, and then overall wellness and um, healthy lifestyle is a means to success. So when you're moving, when you're active, when you, uh, you know, just really physically um, there, it helps your mental state and capabilities. So, so that's really a focus that we have right now. Um, taking a look at this slide. Um, so right now we're really focusing on, like I said, uh, locomotor movement, development, um, cardiovascular and muscular endurance. So at Waverly, they're doing fitness tracks. I'll say the design of the gym in Waverly with um, different shapes, different colors on the ground. They're using letters. They're using math problems in phys ed while moving um, and really executing different locomotor movements has been really impressive. Um, now they're incorporating different exercises into the curriculum and into uh, you know, incorporating that with movement. So that's really been a fun piece for our teachers as well as the kids. Um, and then there's two videos, one from Ann Hutch and one from uh, Greenville that I thought would really just kind of highlight some of the things that we're doing. Um, so the first one looks like oops. it was sound to this, but anyway, they're doing some line dancing to Cotton Eye Joe in this one. Um, and it's really taking those locomotive movements and different movements that they've learned and putting it in combination. Uh, something that the kids are having fun with in, in school. They could do it 12 feet apart, but you could also do it as well as home. Um, the other video is from Ann Hutch, uh, which is really a fitness based thing. And they're playing rock, paper, scissors, fitness. So they're doing rock, the traditional hand rock, paper, scissors. And then they're telling each other, okay, if I won, then you do an exercise and really just trying to create some opportunities where the kids are having fun, but also learning. Um, and these uh, games that are being taught are also being utilized at recess. Um, so I think that's a really good tie in and our teachers and our students, like I said, are doing a very nice job with that. Um, the SEL components, so through our wellness uh, teacher, uh, Coach Creedy, uh, she's working with uh, students about self-esteem, empathy, and cooperation. She's tying those le uh, classroom lessons into what does that mean in the physical education setting um, and what does that translate to in the classroom. So um, I'm very happy with the progress from our phys ed staff at the elementary school. And now we'll take a look at the secondary uh, middle school and high school level. So from our health standpoint, from our curriculum, we're looking at the health triangle, which is physical, social, mental, and emotional health. And that's really been a focus from our health department to start the school year with students being out of school, um, dealing with COVID since March, you know, that's over seven months that the students were not in person. So it's really a focus on goal setting and really focusing on social and mental health. What does that mean? Um, what are some ways that you could handle stress um, and what might work for me might not work for somebody else. So I think that's really important for students to understand and know that. And I think one of the most powerful pieces that comes out of this is the community resources. Um, every health teacher's classroom that I've, I've visited, no matter what the topic was, it always ends, who can you go to? Who, could, who in this building can you go to? And now it's translating to who in the community, if someone in this building can't help you, who else could you turn to? And I think that's really important for our young people to know that if they do have any issues or they need some help, there are people available for them. So I think that's really a, a highlight of our department right now. And as far as physical education goes in the middle school and the high school level, um, our kids are doing 1.5 miles a day when they're in person. They're going at least six times around, if not more. Uh, they could run it. They could walk it. Um, but really, the what they're looking at is the target heart rate. So every student before they go, they find their pulse and they're going. And if they're working at a heart rate zone uh, that's moderate to light, maybe we ask them to increase it. If that's good for their levels, then that's fine. But really the goal is for the, each student to get one and a half miles per class per day. Um, and one of the fun facts, I think I wrote this down, our teacher told us, I think in six weeks, they've gone over 6,400 miles, um, depending. So you could walk to LA and back and still have a couple thousand miles left. Um, I should have fact checked that, but I, I didn't. But I'm going to go with our phys ed staff and trust them on that. But they are working on that. Um, you know, in the near future, we're looking, we're exploring into, you know, what equipment would be acceptable and safe to use in phys ed. Uh, that's all the way K through 12. So we have proper sanitizing uh, 
stations available. We, we have make sure that everything is uh, safe. So we're exploring that as a department and we're going to see if we could roll that out. You know, as the winter months come, I think our teachers are going to get very creative with different movement patterns that they're working on. Um, I know they will infuse some yoga and some mindfulness into the curriculum. And we're working, uh, you know, daily to kind of identify certain areas that we might not have taught before, but we might be interested in now, which is really a positive thing. And, and taking a look ahead, um, I was joking around today, the New York State physical education standards have not been updated since 1996. Um, so this year they rolled out new standards to be implement, implemented for the next school year. So we're starting as a department to kind of identify um, the New York State standards, compare them to the national standards, which was actually a, a very good uh, document, and then look at grade level outcomes. So just like in any other subject area, we want to be able to identify essential skills and content area that all of our, our students should know. And we could identify benchmarks, uh, example, grade, grade one. So what are, what are our students at the end of first grade? What's, what essential skills and concepts should they know going, whether they go to Ann Hutch or Greenvale? And then how do our Ann Hutch and Greenvale teachers know this? And that's something that I think that's really important for our teachers to get on board. And same thing, as we exit Ann Hutch and Greenvale, what is it that is essential for any fifth grader, regardless of what school you went to, what, it, what skills are essential for them to know? So then when they get to middle school, the middle school teachers have an idea. Um, and it's funny when I hear coaches say it, well, what'd they do at that level? They, they come to me and they didn't know anything. Well, no, because it might be a different approach and we know how things go. Summer's long sometimes and people forget. And, but then once we get back into it, everybody picks it up. So I think identifying those skills and concepts will be very important to uh, move this department forward. Um, looking at the social emotional uh, components in health and phys ed uh, is implementing the benchmarks. Uh, in health and PE. So the benchmarks, I mean, we're talking about decision-making, self-management, and these things are embedded in our curriculum, both in health and phys ed. So I think that's something that we want to explicitly teach in those courses. Um, and then health education is implementing a skills-based approach to health ed. So if you go on the website, if you go on any website right now and you want to research something, you can probably find an answer to something. Um, whether it's accurate or not, that is the question. So Part of the skills base is teaching students how to research and find um, acceptable, um, you know, places on the internet to find information rather than just search anything. And, you know, sometimes they can find information that's misinformation, but it looks uh, legitimate. So I think that's part of it. Uh, we talk about when we talk about functional knowledge, if it's drugs and alcohol, sexuality, uh, nutrition, whatever it is, is incorporating decision making, incorporating self-advocacy. Um, interpersonal skills into those uh, topic areas. And that's something that I think will enhance our curriculum and will allow for transfer and greater, um, you know, application of the information and material. So. Thank you, Tom. Very much appreciated. Now we're going to turn it over to Chris Shearer, who is going to take us down the road of social emotional learning. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. I know it's nine o'clock, so we're going to keep moving this along. Um, I have wonderful thought partners in this work that we do as a curriculum team. Tommy talked a lot about um, how we've been working together and incorporating the many, many comparisons to social emotional learning, physical education, and health. So this picture that I put up there is one of my favorite bulletin boards that I see every time I go into Waverly. It sets the tone for the building which is really the essence of social emotional learning, right? It's not one thing, it's everything. It's climate and culture. It's intentionally using evidence-based instruction. It's integrating core curriculum with really the thought of the whole child. So on the theme of surviving, moving to thriving, what does thriving look like in social emotional learning when it comes to East Chester? And this is really, this is on our website. This is um, kind of our mantra right now. It's continuing to build safe and supportive environments, a foundation for equitable, engaging and high quality instruction, best practices and meeting the needs of all students and all teachers. When we think about the four really key things that we wanna focus on, building that fundamental foundational support and a solid plan for social emotional learning that travels with a student from K through 12, strengthening our adult SEL competencies. And that's really done through strong 
professional development and having teachers have the opportunity to work together and to really talk about best practices that are going on within their classroom and within their buildings. And then there's that piece around how do we provide all students with that frequent, well-designed, consistent opportunities to engage and practice. Tommy hit on it. We can teach, but we have to give them the opportunity to practice. So the skills that our students are learning on the playground are ones that they're carrying with them because they're actually practicing them. And we need to do that in the classroom as well. Practice continuum, continual improvement. And that's really where improvement science comes in, where we take a look at what we're doing in a systematic approach to make sure that if we have to change what we're doing, that we do it in a timely way. Um, so what is social emotional right social emotional learning right now. This again came from some of my walkthroughs. Our teachers are so creative in how they welcome their students into their classrooms. I love what I see. It's happening. We're striving to clearly articulate the when, the how, and the when throughout all of our buildings. Curriculum, we've got two um, that we're working, two evidence-based curriculums that we're working with right now. And I know Dr. Urso in her presentation with you in a couple months is really gonna dive into DBT and second step. Um, but those are two programs that are evidence-based that we're focusing on this year. SEL committees, buildings have reinstated and established these committees that meet regularly to find ways to support each other and to support students in their building in really fun ways. I mean, Waverly had their, their, um, their great week uh, with t-shirts and walks and just things that they're doing with their students. The middle school's website is phenomenal. Ann Hutch and Greenvale are really working in their iHeart and their Greenvale programs that are enlightening and heightening and really making it um, just a wonderful place to be. So when we think about the PTA Council, I just, I'm so honored that they're allowing me to be on their social emotional learning um, advisory board or advisory meeting committees that we're really focusing on supporting our parents with workshops. We had one in September, we'll have another one in November that are focusing on um, kind of what, what we feel, how we can help students learn remotely and at home. So our vision is again, making sure that because social emotional learning is not one thing that we're putting it in our mapping with our content area that specifically is, um, shoot, I lost my place. Um, specifically, I'm um, using our benchmarks that Tommy had talked about. And then SEL from a multi-tiered system of support lens is really important for us to begin to think about. And, and if we can just do that next page for us, is this model. And Susan and Jared spoke about it. It's that universal instruction, a more targeted instruction, and intensive um, individualized interventions that really make this model work. It's how we do business is what our multi-tiered system of support is. It's aligning what we already have and using those resources to address our needs in a really efficient and effective way. We'll do one more. And really it's a partnership. We're gonna be talking about this a lot this year, MTSS, but it's a data-driven decision-making model that allows us to adapt and implement a curriculum of evidence-based interventions that'll help us identify and really provide the appropriate supports that our students need. So I'm really looking forward to talking with you a lot more about MTSS. So with that being said, we hope that this gave you a, a, a better idea and a, a better sense of the kind of framework that we're really looking to build. A sense that we're, we're moving past program and really trying to build a philosophy around education that defines us as East Chester, as the East Chester education that our students are getting. So thank you so much. I wanna say a special thank you to our, our curriculum team. Um, honestly, I, I could not do any of this without you. I truly appreciate all of the work that you're putting in. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And with that, we'll open it up if the, the board has any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I just want to say it's good to get back to these presentations. We had them um, at the end. We've had a few, uh, several, uh, and we had them last year all lined up, and um, we hope to continue to have them moving forward to follow suit 
on how we'd like to have the meetings. Is anyone on the board would like to make a comment? All right, so we're gonna move into the next part of our meeting, which I'm sorry, Rob, we didn't look this up. Okay. You know, Sally. Yes, Judah. Someone in, in the audience or the attendance asked a question. I'm not gonna ask it exactly the way they asked it, but it's really exciting actually to see how you guys have analyzed um, the learning structures and the roles and the tactics. I think that's very exciting. Um, Thomas actually showed in his presentation a video uh, of group learning, even during, you know, the hybrid and remote model. Can you guys give us maybe an example of, uh, or a story uh, about some, some group learning experiences at various levels for hybrid and remote students? So that she has them keep them in the classroom so that they can plug it into their device and they're able to have a conversation with someone else without disturbing everybody. So they're able to use a, a lower voice and it worked, it worked beautifully. Um, that's one example. Yeah, Jared and I, when we did our walk. Oh, I wasn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so when Jared and I did our walkthroughs, we were in one of our elementary buildings and we watched a fully remote teacher do a reading lesson where she, again, was had kids in breakout rooms, but she was able to enter rooms, hear, to, hear students read aloud, reading to each other. It was amazing. I mean, what we, we were so inspired by the work that she was doing that it was just phenomenal. Our teachers are also becoming quite proficient in utilizing the Google tools and the Google apps for education. So I saw a lesson in the science classroom at the high school here where they actually had designed the procedure. So similarly, they actually developed, the teacher developed small breakout rooms and then they were all able to collaboratively add to a document in live feed um, succession. So when you have these Google apps, they're actually, everybody can collaborate on the document. So our so teachers have teachers really utilized that to their advantage. advantage because yes, of course, we can't have students right next to one another, but we really don't need that anymore. And in a global society, that's really the way that our, our work is being conducted, right? So as long as there's the skills of communication, the spirit of collaboration, um, the outcomes are actually quite exciting. If I can give one more example, if, it, if you don't mind. I, I did, I did that, yes. <laughs> um, when, just to think about how this might work with our youngest learners, because what we've described requires, or at least what Jared and I described, is that a student is looking at a device. And we don't have that um, for our youngest learners appropriately, that they're not spending their whole day looking at the screen. But I was in a kindergarten classroom um, uh, late last week where the teacher really made a point of involving in the lesson, both the students that were in the room and the students that were at home. And in fact, when a student in the room answered a question, the teacher then turned to face the board and asked the student from home, do you agree? Tell us why. And then give, you know, um, and then of course, you know, being that it was kindergarten, anytime someone got a right answer, there was the, you know, let's give them snaps or, you know, a whoop, whoop. it was a, you know, something that was really building again, that community of learners and helping the kids interact as best they possibly could, given the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, you know, as a parent who basically has been asked not to, you know, not to look at what my, my son is doing in his online classes, um, you know, it's encouraging to hear these stories uh, and 
it's encouraging to know that 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 seems to be doing well with the with the cooperation and collaboration model at all levels. So I, I hopefully that helps some of the parents also who are listening understand that as well. So thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, thank you again. I know this took a lot of time to put together and it's great to see you all come in and we hope to hear from you again, again this semester, right? <laughs> um, now we're gonna move on to our uh, other items on our agenda. Cheryl, if you wanted to do uh, six through 10. Yep, I'll go through them all at once. So um, be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the following additional annual appointment to the CSE CPSE 504 committee as attached. Uh, be it resolved that the Board of Education approves the minutes for the October 13th, 2020 Board of Education work session as attached. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education approves the personnel agenda as attached. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the placements as recommended by the Committee on Preschool Special Education and the Committee on Special Education as attached. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the contract extensions with first student for in-district home to school and athletic and field trip um, contracts for the 2020-2021 school year. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the Treasurer's Report for September 2020 as attached. Be it resolved that the Board of Education uh, accepts the following warrants as attached. Be it resolved that the Board of Education approves budget transfers of $10,000 or more for the month of October 2020 as attached. And be it resolved that the Board of Education approves the agreement between the district and Greenberg, Greenberg North Castle um, School District for the 2020-2021 school year as attached. Um. Steve, would you like to? Yep, I will second that. Okay. Um, any discussion? Uh, do we do discussion? For yeah. Any discussion? Oh, sorry, I'm muted. Go ahead, Vito. Sorry, I'm not muted. All right, I have a question, and it regards the transportation contracts. Uh, the transportation contracts are dealing with a uh, a 100% transportation schedule. And currently we only have an 80% transportation schedule. Why would we sign something without addressing that now? So um, the document that's being approved is the document that goes to the state. If you recall back in the spring, we've already entered in a contract with them where we, um, where we reduced the rate for last year, which agreed to giving them an extension for this year. So that's already been board approved. These documents were just put on here for you guys to see it because they do have to be submitted to the state. Um, as the contract currently stands, we do have a reconciliation provision in the contract. Um, typically how the transportation contract works, 180 days of school, we pay them 18 days each month and then we reconcile at the end of the year for snow days, days that they didn't um, provide transportation for us. So that provision continues to exist in the contract. It's something that we can address with them. Um, we, we've needed their cooperation and we've received a great deal of cooperation from the transportation company to start the school year. We've asked them to go above and beyond. Each bus driver has to um, know two different routes for different days. So where they typically have an elementary and a high school, middle school route, it's now doubled. Um, so they've been very cooperative and very supportive of, of us during this opening. And, um, you know, should we, we kind of just want to see how the opening went before we kind of got into a conversation with them regarding um, how we're going to deal with these Wednesdays. Um, like I said, we, we always have the provision in there to, to reconcile and uh, take reduction for days, but um, we just haven't broached that subject with them yet. And we wanted to kind of get into the school year couple of weeks, couple of months, see how it goes um, before we started having those discussions. Okay, so, so this thing that we're assigning mm -hmm. really is only a form for the state that shows us our gross exposure is what right. you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so it's this is a really a uh, transportation contract. 
it's just a state form that we that's the form that the state wants and it has to be filed with the state um within uh, 90 days of the start of the contract which was september 1st so um you know full transparency i always put the contracts up on the you know for but it's not percent. signed by the transportation company it is form. yeah mm -hmm. it should have yeah. a company this form it. doesn't mention anything about that reconciliation and right, this form doesn't, but the other contract that you approved back in the spring has all that detail on it. I understand that. It's just that there should have been a reference somehow, in my mind, having done contracts for years, that if you've got a contract that has a reconciliation in it, then you have another one that doesn't have a reconciliation in it, and you ultimately end up in a legal dispute, the person you're arguing in front of is going to ask you, well, why didn't this one have the same provision this one had? So can I just... Yeah, I'd like a lawyer's opinion on that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so, if you have so it in one, you should have it in both. I agree with you, but looking at the document, it says, the document that's up here, and as soon as I get it to open, uh, okay, it says, all of the items of said contract shall remain in force and effect. So it references the contract and all of the items in that contract. So I think... This isn't the contract itself. This is a form relating to that contract. The contract itself would spell out that reconciliation, which then that might give us the right to address that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. That's, that's good. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, does anyone else have any comments about items six through 10? Sally? Yes, Judah? This is a technical question, but when we do the budget at the, uh, this is about the treasurer's report. When we do the budget at the, uh, you know, budget time, we just cover uh, the general uh, uh, revenue from state aid. And because sales tax was a new thing in the last couple of years, right, that was just passed, we had that separated. And we knew even back last budget season that we were expecting because of COVID, to have a reduction in the expected sales tax. Lottery tax came in. And I think we also had about a hundred thousand dollar shortage probably because of COVID, right? I mean, you know, empire was closed and whatever else. I don't know if that's true, but does it make sense moving forward to separate out the economic related revenue streams versus state aid, like foundation aid and other things that are sort of decided by regulation? I mean, for the budget, I mean, sales tax is different other than state aid revenue, right? So um, we can, I mean, if, if, if you want to see the state aid categories separated out, um, we could do that. We did receive our lottery aid payment, which right. was 100% of what we were entitled to. They didn't reduce that at all. So no, but by comparison with last year, it was reduced, right? Because there was less lottery money. I think last year we got 900,000. This year we only got about 800 or something. Well, lottery comes in increments. So... Um, Oh, we, so maybe I, okay. Yeah, so we haven't I'm... gotten a hundred percent of our lottery yet because they pay it in installments, Right. but it hasn't been reduced by the 20% that the governor was threatening. So, um, oh, so it's, so is that actually, so is that not economic base? Is that just the, the, the decision of how much we get for the lottery? Yeah. I don't think it's based on the receipts. I think it's based on, you know, a formula. Oh, okay. If that's yeah. the case, then I, then I, I'm sorry. I even asked the question. Yeah. I thought okay. I figured like, Sales tax, we yeah. know because of economic factors and lottery. Also, in my in my sort of figuring yeah. it out, because I looked at last year's number was about a hundred thousand more. Yeah. I said, oh well, that's clearly because fewer people are paying the lottery because of COVID and work and Empire being closed or whatever the reasons. Maybe it should be a separate. Yeah, I don't think factor. it's a direct function of receipts. Okay, yeah. then never mind. Okay. Sorry, Judah, you're my blind spot. Um, no did. Worries, that's why. Piped up. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other comments? Okay, I'm going to ask uh, all in favor to approve six through 10. Anyone opposed? Okay, next, um, our future meeting dates are November 10th, November 24th, and, and December 8th. So now we're going to move to comments of the public. I don't know if I was heard in the beginning. Someone shouted that I was not heard after the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm going to read this again, but we're first going to take comments from the public for the people who are in person. So what will happen is after I read this, 
then you, if you'd like to comment, we ask that you continue to socially distance how you are now. When you come up, the first person can come up to the computer that's right over here. We'll put you on so the people at home and here can see you. We um, then after you're done, if you're the first person, then there's a sign in sheet. Uh, Grace can help us with that a little bit if you don't mind or where it went, I'm sorry. There's a sign in sheet over there. If you could just make sure you put your name, your address and information on there so we can um, get back to you for a follow up. And then after all the in-person comments are finished, we're gonna take the comments. People can raise their hand on um, Zoom and then we will unmute them and bring them into the meeting and they'll be able to have their comments. This isn't like one of our forums where there's a question and answer time. There's some people putting things in the chats or the questions and answers. That's not um, how a board meeting is set up. The board meeting is set up that if the public would like to comment, they're able to comment and then the administration can follow up and the um, board and administration can ask for some clarity. So I'm just gonna read this again because someone shouted from the back that they couldn't hear what I was saying after the Pledge of Allegiance. So our Board of Education is here to serve the community and values your partnership in education. We're very happy when community members attend our meetings and we welcome your comments during the public portion of our meeting. Please bear in mind that public comment is designed for members of the public to address the Board of Education rather than a time for dialogue. To facilitate public comment, the board asks that comments be limited to three minutes and basic norms of civility be observed. Please refrain from comments involving individual district personnel or students, as such matters should be addressed with the administration. Following public comment, boards or members of the board, sorry, following public comment, members of the board or administration may ask clarifying questions as necessary. Please note public comments are taken to heart, will be taken under advisement by the administration for any potential follow up. Um, potential action or follow-up communication. For this reason, we ask you to sign in before making your comment. So at this point, um, our young gentleman over here, um, if you'd like to come up, uh, you can sign in. I, I'm assuming Alice you're, would like to go first. So if the person who would like to go second would like to stand over so they can sign in and we will begin the three minutes once we get you set up, Alice. You can, no, no, go ahead. I just didn't want you to like, oh. you know, get ready. We'll put you in. We'll okay. tell you when you're in. Okay. So, um, Alice Jenny. Oh. I just want to make sure you're here. Okay. There you go. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Alice Jennings. Yes. Al my name is Alice Jennings. Um, nine in a free um, place, East Chester. Um, so for first of all. I'm gonna to try to, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so first of all, I just wanted to, to say my personal opinion that the district has done a wonderful job in helping parents who wanna be fully remote. I, on the other hand, don't. And um, I'm here to rep represent some of the children and parents of East Chester. Um, I'm handing you two documents, one of which is a petition with 563 um, signatures to get our children back to school full time in a safe manner. Secondly, I'm handing an 80 page complaint filed in federal court because of the New York City, I'm sorry, filed in federal court because the New York City Department of Education hasn't reopened and is harming children by not reopening. East Chester has approximately 3000 students. Our situation is clearly very different than New York City, which has probably over 100, 1 million students. Yet this board is acting in the same way, a way in which is acknowledging, everyone is acknowledging is harming the children of our district. On July 23rd, 2020, Dr. Roberts R. R. Redfield, director of the CDC stated that I, and I quote, it is critically important for our public health to open our schools this fall. Towards this goal, the CDC released new science-based resources and tools for schools, administrators, teachers, parents, guardians, and caregivers. Details enclosed in line 15 in the documents provided. The CDC guidance document stated that on July 21st, 2020, 6.6% .6 of COVID-19 cases and less than 0.1 of COVID-19 related deaths are among children and adolescents less than 18 years of old, 18 age, 18 years old in the United States. Dr. Redfield stated that I, and I quote, the best available evidence in indicates that COVID-19 poses relatively low risk 
to school-age children, and they have a negative health consequences on our youth. The district is offering us only a blanket denial and effects of all students. They are not considering whether they can or should offer different options in different scenarios. They are not looking into whether or not to provide additional options to meet the needs of children with special needs, or if they can provide provide more in-person options to our younger students who benefit from less benefit less from remote instruction. This is a time we all need to solve problems together. That doesn't happen when one side completely refuses to consider options and has ignored the needs of particular vulnerable groups. We are recommending plexiglass, mask, and a three feet spacing to accommodate what other schools in other regions of New York private schools and other states are using to have a full successfully committed program to have fi a five day in-person school. We are here in person and through Zoom for answers on the, what steps this district will be taking to stop and harming our children and get them back to school in a full and safe way. Please tell us your next steps and what you are talking, what you are taking away from our questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Oh, thank you. Um, on to Benicos. Can you hear me? Yep. On to Benicos. Okay. Hi, so I would first like to thank the district for working so diligently to reopen safely given the constraints the state imposed. I'm sure it was not an easy task, especially with the odds stacked against you. While the year so far is certainly better than what we experienced in the spring, for my family, it's not enough. I have a ninth grader and a fourth grader who are struggling academically and socially due to hybrid learning. My older son who loved school finds all the missing social pieces like lunch, recess, seeing all his friends in school daily, extremely unmotivating. These are the things that helped him get through the academic struggles of school. And now that they're not there, his drive-in interest in school is much less. I offered him the option to convert to completely remote and he chose to stay hybrid because he says he enjoys seeing his teachers as much as he can. My fourth grader is struggling with the technology. Mom, I can't drag and drop. Mom, I can't click the text box. Mom, Mr. Zante can't hear me playing the trumpet. This is what I hear all day when he's home. And based on the students' comments in the Google feed, I know he's not alone. He was a student who didn't like school to begin with, and now it's even worse. We were told last week at a PTA meeting that curriculum is being cut, that screen time imposed on our students is not appropriate. How is high tax paying parents, can we stomach this? It does not seem that the district is looking to make any changes to the format. Is this the future of our education in East Chester? Until when? Until we get a vaccine that becomes available for which our children are last on the list of priorities? It's very disappointing to hear that nearby districts have made full-time in-school learning a priority. Just miles away, students like my fourth grading, grader are getting live instruction every day. I would like to request the district consider every option to give our East Chester students the in-person education they are entitled to. We hear that there's no budget, but there are certainly low cost options to further in-person learning. For example, completely emptying the classrooms to accommodate more students, the use of plastic barriers to reduce the social distancing space, utilizing all school spaces for classes like art and music rooms, Reducing the daily schedule time to allow for teacher prep instead of dedicating an entire Wednesday to it. And I'm sure that there are many more. Let's be creative, let's think out of the box. At least let's consider getting our students back in the building on alternating Wednesdays. Perhaps it's time to survey the parents again. I know I changed my vote now that I'm six weeks into this. I recently read an article stating that nearby Westchester school districts successfully reopened full-time due to the will of the district's leaders. Does our district have the will needed to make this a priority and reality for our children? Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so before, um, I don't see anyone running up to the podium. Was there anyone else? Um, thank you. You can come on over. Um, I didn't prepare anything. Okay. Hi, I'm Chrissy Gagan. I have three children in the district, one at Waverly, one at Ann Hutchinson, and one in middle school. Um, I didn't prepare anything, but I just want to say that I find it very upsetting and concerning that we have a petition with 560 signatures. Um, and also, I know that the Waverly PTA sent out a survey surveying the parents and less than 10% responded that the current hybrid model is working for their child. Yet there is still no plan to make any changes. I find that very concerning that there are so many parents who are saying this is not working for their children. Um, I also find it concerning that you have acknowledged that the hybrid model is not age appropriate. It is not age appropriate for four to six year olds to learn on Zoom, yet there's still no plan to make any changes. Um, I, I feel like all of the suggestions that have been made, there are responses like we can't do it because of busing or we can't do it with plexiglass, but there are schools that are making this work. For example, Catholic schools have full capacity and they are using plexiglass and the students are three feet apart and there have been no cases. And here in Eastchester, if you look at our numbers, there are maybe six cases in Eastchester out of maybe 20,000 people. Our numbers are so, so low. I, I just don't understand how that can be the final answer. And I just ask you to please consider what all these parents are saying. I, I understand that you are the school board, but we are the town. And we are paying the taxes and we are saying this is not working for our kids. So please reconsider. Sorry that you saw my back, all of you, the whole time. Um, does anyone else have here? Um, I know my back to some people. Okay, we're gonna move on to the um, Zoom. Can you come over to the? Um, well, they might not have an answer, but can you? You said you're sending out a link tomorrow. Why didn't you send it ahead of the meeting? You know, you worked you know, on this, this link this, probably. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to answer, but this isn't what we do in board meetings. It's okay. question and answer, yeah. but, but it's a simple question. I basically have been uh, writing a document that takes some time. I've had it ready like on Sunday. And knowing that there were probably people coming, um, I felt it would be better to wait and hear what you have to say rather than me trying to be perceived as heading something off. Right? I don't want I don't want to send something out that's gonna to try to, you know, maybe lessen the impact of people coming, right? Because if I give you information try to maybe get ahead of an argument or a point you may have. So also you may have questions that come up tonight that I can include in the document. All the document is is what some of the things that you, you, you know. Yeah. 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 Okay, we're not going to go, okay, excuse me, we're not going to go back and forth, but if you wanted to have a discussion with the administration, yeah, you can talk after. So, okay. Okay, at this point, we're going to, um, if you have a question, yep, go ahead. You could just come up to the microphone. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Linda McGann-Juleiden. I have three children in the district. I have one in middle school and two at Greenville who are fifth grade. One of my children is classified. Um, virtual learning is really, really hard for children with IEPs. Um, I'm also an educator. I've been teaching for 22 years. I'm in a school district right now that has plexiglass, three feet. We have 24 COVID cases. You can check our school report card. So I'm not advocating for all in model because I live it and I see the problems with it, but I would really like a conversation between the parents and the district to maybe after this winter, God willing, it will not be as bad as they say, that in the spring we come together and we really work for our children, whether that's bringing portables in, whether that's you know clearing out the music, making the gym a classroom, but really trying to make up for what has happened last spring, this fall and the winter. Um, I think when you see some of the uh, conversations, when people come up with suge suggestions and they're like, no, we can't do it, we can't do it. It's very demoralizing. And I think it's wonderful, the curriculum presentation, but I'm a teacher and I'm the teacher doing some of the things that they're saying. And then you hear, my child couldn't get on the Zoom. Their volume didn't work. The babysitter didn't know how to get on Google Classroom. Like, that's what you're hearing in the background. I live it too with my kids. One of my daughters is on quarantine. So the two days that she's supposed to go to middle school, she couldn't go. My husband is a central worker. I'm a teacher. What do we do then? You hope your babysitter will, allow, will come to your house even though your child's in quarantine. Like it's just too much on working parents and too much on our kids. And we need to have a conversation, not like a soliloquy. Thank you. Natalie. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalie Vero. I have two children. I have a third grader and a second grader at Greenvale. And um, I can say that it is quite the struggle for even a third grader to navigate through some of the classrooms. Um, but my main question up here is what if this virus doesn't go away? What if it stays like this? What are our plans as a school? Are we going to knock down the school buildings and not pay school taxes and have teachers virtual virtually teach? Are our children just a science experiment right now with screen time? You know, like how do we know that our children are retaining this information and we're not hurting them in the long run? So thank you for your time. But I just wanna know really, what if this virus never goes away because it is mutating constantly. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, sure. I just didn't see you coming. Uh, my name is Michelle Waller. I have four children in the district. I have a senior in high school. I have a junior in high school. I have a sixth grader and I have an eighth grader. Um, I didn't come here to really speak, but I just felt like I needed to say something on behalf of the kids in the district. Um, it's very, very hard socially for all these kids. My sons would go to Garth every Friday and they'd play basketball. Now the hoops are gone. They go up to handle to play flag football, told they have to leave. They cannot be up there anymore. Otherwise they will get a summons because a lot of kids are going there to drink. And I worry that my son who's a senior, like the seniors last year, are gonna miss out on some of the best moments in their life. The kids that are in college, their freshman year, guess what? Missing out on some of the best moments in their life. And as a parent, it makes me angry because I think the cure now is worse than the disease. I don't think you understand, or there's so much of a focus I hear on, you know, the curriculum, the curriculum, and, but I'm really not getting any understanding of the social, emotional well-being of our children. And it's, 
it's unbelievable to me that we're now focusing more on that because my senior could probably be online all year without a teacher's help and, and do fine. You know, what he really needs is to be able to be a kid, to be able to play with his friends, to be able to go to the park, to be able to go to prom, to be able to graduate. Is this what's gonna happen to the seniors this year? Are they gonna suffer the same fate as the seniors last year? I hope not. I hope that we do better for our kids because they're missing out. Thank you. I don't have, my name is Dawn. I have nothing prepared. Um, I have one child left in the school district. She's in eighth grade. Um, struggling like everyone else is. Kids want to be back in school. Um, we're, we're separating the kids. We're not making them go to school every day. They're going every other day. We're keeping them six feet apart. At gym, they're 12 feet apart. As soon as the school bell rings and dismissal, all those kids are going to Dunkin' Donuts together. They're going to Starbucks together. Their friends that they didn't see yesterday are coming over to somebody else's house. These kids are together all the time anyway. I think so. Does anybody else agree with that? Thank you. So we're not really accomplishing separating them because this is making them come together more than it was in the beginning. And I think another issue is a huge majority of kids and people in this district have had this virus already. So if you ask any of the doctors, if you have the antibodies, you still have some sort of protection. You're not gonna get it again. Maybe you'll get it next year. They don't know about that. But right now, if you've had it and recovered from it, you're pretty much immune at this point. I believe that's what I've been told. Um, so I think we have to kind of take into consideration those things as well. If we have 100 kids in the district and 80 of them had it, why are we still doing this? I think there has to be a better way. I don't think we're accomplishing anything by not making them go to school every day. That's just my opinion. Thank you. We're gonna thank you everyone for your, um, um, thank you for taking the time. We know it's almost 10 o'clock. We actually, I think might have some people who are on Zoom. So what we do here is someone can raise their hand on Zoom and then um, we let them in the room, kind of how you were a panelist here and then they speak and we hope we hear it the same way you would hear it. So we would repeat it if need be. So, um, is there anyone on Zoom that wants to raise their hand yeah, to speak? There, there are two hands raised. Oh, I can't see. Go ahead, Judah. You can do your magic. Who's, who's audio? Am I using my audio or are we using one of the other computers? No, I know, but for hearing here. Everyone's audio is turned off, right? Okay. So, so I'm just going to repeat the question? Yeah. Okay. And you don't want me to put on the do you want to put your audio on so we can try and hear it and then you can you repeat? Want, you want me to try it? Yeah, try it. All right. So, so I believe the hand raises are in sequence. And if they're not in sequence, I apologize, but we'll get to all. There's right now two. I'm going to start with uh, Natalie. Uh, and I apologize if I don't pronounce your name right. Natalie Conoridis. And I'm going to promote you to panelist. And it's going to ask you to unmute yourself. And you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Ready? Here we go. OK. All right, Natalie, you should be able to unmute yourself and answer your question. Good evening, can you hear me? We do. Okay, perfect, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank Thanks, you man. for the, the presentation on the curriculum changes. I think just one of my concerns is I very, I very much got the impression that it would take time for those curriculum changes to be rolled through. So as much as I think there's good intentions behind it, I don't think that it's, it doesn't seem like it would create many of the um, 
uh, fix many of the problems that we're currently experiencing. Um, I think um, I have a child at Waverley and I have a child at Anne Hatch as well. Um, and certainly um, I was reading the Waverley communication that came out from the PCA this evening. Um, and I think what struck me was um, the comments about the fully remote family saying that, you know, that, that it's been very successful for them. Um, I have, my, my child is just not, doesn't concentrate very well on computers at all and we really struggle with him to focus. Um, but I just wondered um, what is being done to kind of really um, uh, gather information in terms of what's working. Um, it, it seems like the dedicated teacher focused on the screen maybe makes some, somewhat of a difference. And certainly something that I felt is that there's maybe, you know, with the strained resources in the district, is there not an opportunity to redeploy some of the, the teachers, you know, the, the special teachers that do yeah, um, other subjects that maybe are not as critical, you know, is there, is there a possibility of, of utilizing them in a different way just to try and help support the, the other teachers academically? Um, I also noticed the comments from Dr. Glass around monitoring the issues regularly and, and making sure they'll make changes um, if possible and where appropriate. I think one of the challenges for me is that I've, I felt that there's been a lack of transparency. Um, I, I try and keep track of everything, but I certainly um, would appreciate if, they, if you could share what issues you are hearing, um, you know, what, what information are the teachers sharing about what's working and what's not working. I mean, that would be very interesting, I think, to parents. Um, you know, how often are you, are you re-evaluating the situation? Who's involved in that re-evaluation of, in terms of what's working, not, what's not working? Um, I think it's just really having a very proactive approach to this and being transparent. Um, I just get a very strong sense that it's more of a reactive approach at the moment. All right, I'm not sure how much we heard here. I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna try and reiterate your, your questions or at least the key points. Um, and you can chime in if I don't quite do a great job, but I'm not sure you'll get an answer tonight. Anyway, the, the question, the two key points were, uh, Natalie said that uh, that uh, she has um, children who are fully remote, and although there has been some conversation about what what is working, she's concerned that in her house it does there are things that definitely are not working, and uh, asked what are we doing from the standpoint of data collection and communicating with teachers to analyze what's not working and try and rectify that. She expressed some dissatisfaction that she perceives. Uh, that there's not enough transparency in, in that process. And uh, so we are at the point that she would like to, uh, to uh, you know, have, have a better understanding of, of how, we're, how we're working to improve, continuously improve the, uh, the remote learning. Uh, hopefully, Natalie, I got that pretty close. Yes, I think so. Maybe just to clarify, my children are in the hybrid model, but it, it seems like oh, okay. there's some learning from the remote models that could be replicated for the, the days that the children are not at school. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna put you back as a uh, an attendee. So uh, I'm not sure if we'll have any more questions about, there are responses from the, from the group here about that, but uh, that was useful. Great, thank uh, you. Oops, all right. Um, Sally, do you wanna? Yeah. Yep. All right. So I'm going to, uh, duly Gurdon, I'm going to promote you to a panelist and you'll be able to unmute yourself and, ask, and, and make your comment. Okay. Julie, you should be able to. I just found my unmute button. Thank okay. you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I really appreciated uh, the presentations about the curriculum. They answered a lot of questions that I've had about um, what the curriculum was looking like moving forward and also gave insights into all the hard work that's being done by the district um, as we um, embark on this um, hybrid learning situation. I also, I also really appreciate the engagement of um, my fellow parents in the community. I thought there were a lot of very interesting comments and um, it's good to see that you know, we've got a lot of folks um, coming to the Board of Ed meetings and sharing um, thoughts. I would have liked to have participated today in person, but unfortunately um, my child is under quarantine due to an exposure at EMS, um, as are many of her teachers and fellow students. 
And I would just like to ask, um, as we as parents ask for the district support in refining and iterating on hybrid plans, and as we see is already being done, um, and as those plans are being adjusted, particularly for younger learners, it is important to remember that the number of COVID cases in Westchester is climbing and the safety of our families, teachers and staff is paramount. I'm grateful to the district um, for following all of the required health guidelines in the, in, during the reopening process. And I know and I trust that safety will continue to be a prior, priority as we move forward with any new plans and adjustments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not good at this. Is there, Judah, is there anyone else raising their hand? I can't tell, I'm not good. Uh, looks like there's one more. Okay. Thank you, sorry, I can't even figure that out. We hear you now, Renee. Oh, but you're really, we heard you for a moment. All right, I think I got it. So hi, this is this is Renee Howe. I have a um, a daughter who's a junior at the high school. One, I just wanted to thank the school board for having this meeting, and second, uh, to all of the staff at all the schools for. Um, you know, working so hard under such difficult conditions. So um, I'm a, a professional who works in the health care field. I've actually been working with a team to develop COVID tests during this time. So we've been working not only all over the United States, but all over the world as well. And one thing I can, I can say is the reason that the cases are low in the state of New York is because exactly that we've taken these measures. In other places in the country where there have been no precautions taken, no limitations placed or very few limitations, those hospitals are currently in a lot of places being inundated with very sick people. Uh, I know a few hospitals in Utah are right now are undergoing uh, decisions where they have to, um, you know, decide which patients get life-saving equipment and which ones don't because they don't have enough to go around. So I just wanted to reiterate that while things do seem, you know, to be good here in New York, that's because we've been very conservative in our approach. And I just wanted to remind people of that. Um, also, somebody said that the virus is mutating uh, extensively. And I also want to point out that that is not true. We really don't know right now um, what the mutation pattern is of the virus. It's very, um, early in this epidemic still. And, and I just wanna caution people that a lot of scientific data has been flooded onto information systems. Um, scientists made a decision to forego the normal peer review process under the pandemic. So people have to be very careful about interpreting the data they hear. So I just wanted to point those things out. And again, thank the school for doing the job they're doing. Thank you, Renee. I'm not even going to try to see Judah's. No, uh, I think that we we had a couple of messages come through, but they're they're mostly questions of some of the comments that were made, asking about uh, at least bringing Wednesdays back, um, asking concerns about uh, social emotional learning. Um, and asking about you know checking in and measuring and monitoring with teachers how, how we're doing. So I'm not going to read each one independently, but those are the key points, and we'll save that. Oh, you, you see it, and that is true. You see Uber, but it's there now. So I'll go ahead and uh, welcome Melissa Uber. We're going to promote you to panelist. 
And oh, Melissa, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, I was able to unmute myself. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to, um, I have a sixth grader in the district um, who's also under quarantine right now. Um, and, you know, very disappointed that, you know, he won't be able to go trick or treating. Little does he know that he wasn't going to go anyway. Um, I am a parent that, you know, has not allowed my child, who is an only child, um, to socialize with his friends after school. He has limited contact with other children um, and other adults for that matter. And he goes, you know, he's in the hybrid model. Um, and I do that as a precaution for, you know, mostly his grandparents that all have very severe underlying conditions. And I want them to still be able to see my child. Um, I appreciate everything that the school district has done um, I was concerned at the very beginning of um, school that, you know, on the days that he was home watching on the computer, that there would be no engagement. And um, it has been, you know, totally contrary to, to what I thought was going to happen. And I applaud all of the teachers, all of the effort, the, you know, the district, um, the superintendent, everybody that's involved um, that has, that have tried to engage you know, all the kids under these, you know, unprecedented, you know, circumstances in the best way that they can, given the limitations that we're currently under and the limitations that they have. Um, and, and I just wanted to, you know, indicate that, you know, I'm, I'm very supportive of the district. I am very appreciative of the district. And I know that, you know, as much as I have a lot of empathy for parents with younger children, I don't know if I would feel the same way if my child was five or six years old. Um, probably not. Um, you know, perhaps there needs to be a conversation with, you know, the younger, you know, par the parents with the younger grade kids to see what additional support can be offered to them. Um, but I know that the district and everybody involved is doing the best that they can. And, um, you know, our kids will overcome. I mean, that that's, that's my feeling that they will learn from this. It's the way that us as parents will move them forward along with all the teachers and the guidance counselors and everybody in the district that will move our kids along and, you know, they will get there and they, you know, they will be stronger for this. That's my belief. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. No, I don't see it. Okay, at this point, we're gonna conclude the comments from the public section, which then brings us to uh, number 13, the comments from the Board of Education. Would anyone like to say anything? You know, I always have something to say. Yeah. Uh, I just want to thank everybody who came out here tonight. And I want to thank everybody who dialed in. We had 96 people on the Zoom call. Uh, it shows that people really are interested in what's going on in the school district. It shows that people have a wide range of opinions on how we should be proceeding and going forward. And like general society, some people want us to be fully open. Once some people want us to be fully shut down. And there's a lot of people in the middle who want us to operate in the middle. And, you know, we have to respect all of their positions. Uh, we don't have to agree with them all. I mean, I agree with a lot of them, to tell you the truth. And I don't think anybody here in this room would disagree with we all want to be open full time. But it's just that we have to get there. And, you know, if the experts are telling us that we're not there yet, then we just have to go with what the experts are telling us. It's unfortunate. We're just going to have to write it out. You know, I, I'd love to open tomorrow, but it's just not in the cards. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Vito. And I want to mute myself. Yeah. Cheryl? Uh, yeah, I, well, I'll echo, you know, thank you everyone who came out and spoke. We're 
it was really good to hear from everyone. Um, and we appreciate the, the, the clarity um, of your comments. And uh, it's, it's just good to have you at the meeting. I also, you know, as we've been talking about curriculum instruction and the evolution of the program, I just really want to give a shout out to um, the teachers who, uh, you know, I continue to see personally through my child experience going above and beyond with uh, unnecessary, you know, un unrequired, I'm not going to say unnecessary because they feel quite necessary, extra help sessions, offers for extra help, sharing of, you know, you know, reaching out uh, to the students who are struggling in the different content areas, for instance, math and science in particular, which are often, you know, particularly hard subjects and, and offering those um, one on ones and extra help and I really and extra help sessions and groups as well really appreciate it and just wanted to acknowledge um, the the creativity and, and the extra effort that the teachers are, are putting in to help keep the keep the students afloat. So this is sort of the the umbrella of everything that we're talking about education is is going on <clears throat> in, in its imperfect and, and perfect iterations um, and the teachers are continuing to to labor away and be creative and go the extra mile really just wanted to acknowledge that thank you thank you Cheryl yes Judah so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna echo something also similar um, I'll be with a slightly different flavor um, because of something that somebody made a comment about tonight, sort of criticizing that we haven't been looking at this. Um, during the presentation, Scott showed a great slide of, of the guys on the on the I beam, uh, all being superheroes, and re in reference to the teachers being the superheroes in the district. Um, you have heard me say when we discussed this months ago. I mean, we've been discussing this nonstop since really last year. And uh, I sort of take exception to the notion that we're not looking at this and we're not trying to get better. Uh, I was I expressed gratitude to to the administration for offering remote as an option when it wasn't mandated and necessary or required um, and said that I think we were doing great things by offering as many options as we can realistically under the you know guidance from the state and the other things. So I'll, I'll echo that again, because I really do believe that our administration and our teachers are superheroes. This is a challenge that no one you know, has had to face before this year. And moving a district of 3,300 students uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't happen overnight and changing things doesn't happen overnight. But it's not something that any of us has left out of the forefront of our mind since this has started. So uh, I hope that the things out there realize that, accept that, and even if they're not hearing every step of the way, um, and even if they don't agree with where we're at and where we're going or how we're getting there, um, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware that this is this is pretty much all we're talking about uh, for a long time and maybe for so for a lot longer. So hopefully we'll come out of this and everybody will be uh, saved by the superheroes or whatnot. Uh, in whatever way is best for our for our kids and our families and our community. So. Okay. Um, is there any other board members who would like to make a comment? Okay. Yes, Vita. I just want to add one comment, if I may. Uh, the one thing I, I forgot to say was. I think the one thing that we've learned over the first six or seven weeks of this process, and we he we heard it from the parents and we hear it from the parents, and, and I'm sure the teachers are seeing it, is that every one of our students learns differently. Every one of them. Whatever a teacher is doing in a classroom is not good for everyone. There's going to be some kids who get it, some kids who don't get it. And, and they're all learning differently. And, and during this time that, that we're, we have all these restrictions on our hands, we've got to take what we're learning from this. And as we come out of this, learn from it and apply that better going forward that maybe we can't teach all kids the same way going forward. And that's just a real high level question that I'm throwing out there or, or observation 
but uh, I, I think I think that's what's one of the good things we're going to find out about this. Maybe we'll be better off for it in the future. So, enough said. Thank you. All right. Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Vito, Steve, would you like to second. second it? All in favor? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining in.